Welcome to the Dean's Roundtable. I'd like to begin by welcoming students from the Grenoble School of Management in France to the Dean's Roundtable. Grenoble is a beautiful city surrounded by the French Alps and the school is one of the strongest in Europe. I was a visiting professor at Grenoble several years ago and know the school and the city well, so welcome. It's now my pleasure to introduce Michael Harrington, our guest today. Michael P. Harrington joined Memorial Sloan Kettering in June 2019 and is the Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. In this role, he is responsible for the overall financial integrity of Memorial's integrated system of clinical care, research, and education, which encompasses more than 17,000 employees and features an enhanced capacity to deliver cancer care as an outpatient as well as inpatient settings. He has more than 25 years of financial and leadership experience with healthcare systems. Prior to joining Memorial Sloan Kettering, Mr. Harrington spent 12 years at the Cleveland Clinic as Associate Chief Financial Officer for that health system. Mr. Harrington graduated from Goldby Beacon College in Wilmington, Delaware with a degree in accounting and holds a master's in business administration from Creighton University in Omaha, Nebraska. Please welcome Mike Harrington to the Dean's Roundtable. Welcome, Mike. Uh, thank you, Ileana. It shows that I'm uh, disabled on sharing, so I don't know if you can uh, set me up, make sure I'm good to go. One second. I thought I'd put a few slides together for you just to kind of help go through the, the slide deck and give you some visualization of what I'm going to share with you. Hopefully it helps uh, kind of paint a picture of exactly what what I've experienced over the past, I'll call it 30 years of, of working. My bio, I did, Larry, thanks for reading that. I'm gonna to have to update that. Um, it's making me a little bit younger than I actually am. Here we go. All right. So there's my, my fancy title. Hopefully you can all see the, the screen. Um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk you all through just a kind of a chronological, um, uh, picture of kind of where I came from and how I got to where I'm at today. So hopefully give you some perspective and then end with some lessons learned uh, along, along those 30 years of, of working uh, in the experiences that I've had. And so I am originally from uh, the Omaha, Nebraska area. And you'll see that I actually spent a little bit of time on the East Coast, finishing up my college, Builder Beacon Colleges in Wilmington, Delaware. And I remember being out somewhere and somebody asked me where I was from and I said, Nebraska, and their response was, well, what state is that in? So again, you know, it's a, it's a small world, but certainly Nebraska is right in the, the middle and in the heartland and I grew up in the Omaha area. Now, how did I get there? And, you know, if we were in person, I could do a little more quizzing with you guys, but basically in Omaha, there is an Air Force base. Uh, and my father uh, was in the Air Force for 20 years and decided to settle there uh, in, in the Omaha area where the Air Force base was. And literally this was a picture that was on the wall in the basement. Um, and my father was an enlisted military guy. So if you guys know what enlisted means, there's officers, which are kind of the managers. And then there's the enlisted people, which are kind of the, if you will, hourly workers. And so, um, you know, I grew up with a brother and two sisters, and my mom stayed home early on. And so you can imagine, uh, we did not have a lot of, a lot of resources. Uh, so that was sort of my upbringing. The good thing for me was I was the um, oldest boy. So my brother was the one getting all the hand-me-downs. At least I got the first, you know, crack at the new stuff, and then he got it after that. I, um, you know, grew up there, and what was interesting about, uh, you know, being, you know, that experience of, of growing up is, you know, I thought to myself, you know, I, I need, I don't, I don't want to grow up like this. I want my kids to grow up like this. I want to be able to provide a better, you know, kind of home life for them in terms of resources and uh, the ability to have uh, access to things. And so basically I had to basically spend all my own money to get to college. My father, the famous saying he, and so I started out here at the University of Nebraska, and I'll come back to this in a second. My, my father, his famous saying was, you know what, I can't pay for all four of you to go to college. So it wouldn't be fair to pay for any one of you to go to college. And again, I was one of the older ones and my sister had no interest. My older sister had no interest in going to college. So I had to figure this out myself. Um, and the backstory to all of this was, 
I was uh, a really good baseball player. I was six foot three in ninth grade and I could throw a pretty mean fastball. And I thought that I was gonna go to the major leagues and school didn't matter. And the bottom line was I didn't work at it. I didn't spend time working at my craft. And so I didn't get any better as I went through uh, high school. And then I broke my ankle, dislocated at my senior year. And so then all of a sudden I was sitting there going, now what am I gonna do? And so my simple mind was, I'm gonna pursue accounting because if you know something about the numbers and money, maybe you can get some money. So that was my simple mindedness at the time was pursue accounting. I know about the numbers. Maybe that'll lead me to something where I can actually be successful and actually make some money. So I started out at the University of Nebraska and keep in mind, again, I was putting the bill for this. So I didn't actually go to Lincoln. University of Nebraska uh, had a, a branch that was in Omaha. So I was able to live with my folks and be able to commute back and forth to school. And my, a lot of my friends went to the University of Nebraska and Lincoln. And what I found was I was, my, my major was having fun and it wasn't really taking me anywhere. And so I finally, after a couple of years, decided that I probably needed to get serious about school and put my mind to actually working hard. And so what I did is I uh, transferred from the University of Nebraska to a small school in Wilmington, Delaware. You're probably thinking, how did I get to Wilmington, Delaware? My father and mother grew up there. And so I basically moved in with my widowed grandmother and I lived with her uh, for a period of time as I finished up my undergrad. And I kind of doubled down and made the commitment to, you know, go from my, you know, low B average to trying to work hard. So my first semester, I made the Dean's List. And that was the first time that I connected hard work to actually a good result. And it was addicting. It was addicting to me. And so I just really felt good about, wow, I actually applied myself and got a result. And so I finished uh, up with Goldie Beacon College and I was um, with an accounting degree. And what ended up happening is I ended up visiting somebody I knew in Washington, DC. And at the time it was in the like 1990, 91 timeframe, there was a recession. If you studied any business history, that was a pretty big recession going on. There was a lot of consolidation in the accounting industry. There used to be big eight, now there's big four, and that was all happening and consolidating during that time period. And the only kind of jobs that were open were internal audit jobs. And I really wasn't interested in that. And I knew I wanted to get my MBA because I didn't really want to be an accountant. I wanted to be a business person and use my accounting knowledge to give me an edge in terms of the business world. And so I, I knew I wanted to take an MBA. So I went to Washington, D.C. to see somebody that I knew. They were there on a, a seminar and I met, uh, met her boss and he actually was working at Creighton University Medical Center in the Department of Radiology. And he convinced me to take a job at, at Creighton University. And I kid you not, the, this is when I learned about human resources. The job was a medical secretary, a medical secretary, and it paid $8.35 an hour. And he basically told me, he said, look, I, I you know, want you to take this job, you get a free MBA, and there's somebody else that you know, is probably gonna be leaving and then you can take that person's job. And so I took the, the job of medical secretary. Now he said, the only thing is you have to actually type 50 words a minute. And I thought to myself, wow, I can type, but I don't know if I can type that well. So I, instead of like preparing for like accounting, all this other stuff, I was practicing typing because I had to go take a typing test. And if I didn't pass the typing test, I couldn't get the job. So just a perspective for you guys of, you know, trying to be too picky on your first job, you just want to get a job and get in the workforce and certainly get the best you can. But at the time there wasn't a lot of jobs. And so this came with a free MBA plus, you know, the ability to, you know, move into this other role, which eventually happened. And I became the assistant administrator in the Department of Radiology at Creighton uh, University Medical Center. Great, great experience. And so essentially that's how I got to Creighton is that, and I did a dual thing. I got my MBA and then I also worked there for a couple of years. So instead of just going straight MBA and not having any work experience, I finished my MBA in the evening and was able to get two years of work experience. And then at that point, you can know I wasn't making a lot of money and the benefits were good, but they were not that good anymore because I'd finished my degree. So I branched out and I looked for uh, another job and I landed a job with United Healthcare. And not that you guys are gonna know much about the insurance business, but 
for whatever reason, I got into what's called health maintenance organizations and looking at basically what was happening in the delivery of healthcare from an insurance point of view and a managed care point of view. And then all of this sort of went out of vogue uh, at some point in the um, late 90s. And so I thought it was a lost uh, experience. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. And so, you know, basically then I went to work for a health system. So the Creighton Medical Center and this organization called Allegiant Health eventually became one. And I, they, upon their consolidation, uh, they had a, a position in what I'll call financial analysis and planning come open. And it kind of intrigued me. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and, and throw my hat in, even though I'm not sure I'm all that experienced for the job. And I ended up getting the job. And this was probably the most stressful time of my career because I was way over my head. And I, you know, basically it was kind of like survival mode. And I just, this is where another kind of, you know, going to Goldie Beacom College and getting onto the Dean's list. This was one of those things where, okay, there's, you know, nothing I can't do if I put my mind to it and use the resources around me. And so I, you know, took on this role and learned and learned and learned. And, you know, the only thing that I would say to you guys is I didn't have Google at the time. So there was no way for me to look at something and say, what is that? And Google it and figure it out. You had to figure it out the hard way. And so this to me was a pivotal point in my career in terms of learning the uh, health system organizations, how they work, how hospitals work, and all the interconnectivity in terms of taking care of patients. And it was a great, great experience for me. I worked for a CFO that had been a for-profit uh, CFO. And obviously, you know, the, most of the health systems out there are not for profit. And so he taught me some things that I took for granted until I went other places and realized that, you know, what we were doing at Allegiant was something that was beyond what most organizations were doing. And it served me well, you know, through my, through my career. And so I spent five years there and I was reporting to the CFO, well, I should say six years there. And there really wasn't any place for me to go with the biggest health system in town. And, you know, I really didn't want to leave Omaha, but I thought to myself, if I'm really going to advance my career, I'm going to have to probably leave. So I went to this place called Parkview Health. And again, another job that, you know, I was in over my head. So somehow I was able to convince these folks. Uh, and I, and I, you know, I think what happened here was interesting story is that I went to look at this job. And I also went to look at a job in London, Kentucky, look it up. They claim to have the largest, you know, frying pan and that, you know, somehow Kentucky fried chicken was invented there somehow. At least that's what they told me that maybe that was their selling point on the job. And I also went and looked at um, a job in Minnesota. It was an outpost of the uh, male health system. And I ended up being number two at Parkview, number two. And I thought, oh, that stinks. And my wife the whole time was like, Fort Wayne, Indiana, Fort, Fort Ware, what is that? And I ended up um, looking like I was gonna get the offer in Minnesota. We went up there to look and my wife was like, I'm not moving to Minnesota. It was not you know, the most desirable place to move. Um, and so I thought my search was all over. I went to the gas station. I was gonna fill up the car. We we're gonna drive back to Omaha. And guess who called? The recruiter from Parkview telling me that, hey, guess what? The number one person dropped out. She's like, well, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm, I'm actually up in Minnesota, you know, finishing up my interview for mail and uh, they're gonna probably make me an offer. So all of a sudden I was, I had a, I had a good leverage point because they had no other candidates, but I spent five years there again, fortunate enough working for another CFO that had been in the for-profit setting and learned a ton. And after about four and a half years there, my view was I'm sticking here and I'm gonna raise my family here. And uh, we put a pool in the backyard um, the year before, you know, as a sign, we didn't really wanna, wanna move anywhere. And then all of a sudden I was sitting at my desk and I got a call from a recruiter and I thought it was somebody else. I don't normally pick up the phone, but we were doing a bond transaction to uh, finance a hospital we were building in LaGrange, Indiana. And I picked up the phone and it was a recruiter and they said, hey, you know, this is the, you know, Cleveland Clinic has a job, a number two finance job. And 
you know, most of you are probably maybe not fully aware of Cleveland Clinic, but it would be like New York Presbyterian here. You know, it's number four hospital uh, in the world, basically number one heart center for the last 25 years. Phenomenal. You know, so to, to you guys, any Mets fans, I'm sorry, but this was to me like the New York Yankees. You know, I was wanted to be a big league baseball player. And but, you know, it was one of these things where I thought there's no way it's like buying a lottery ticket. And so I, you know, basically told the recruiter I'd center my stuff and just forgot about it. Two weeks later, I get a call back. And you know what? I hadn't even told my wife yet that this had happened. So anyways, long story short, um, I ended up getting a job in Cleveland and, you know, hit it off with uh, the CFO that was there that was moving up from the position that I was coming into. And believe it or not, he was a enlisted uh, Air Force son. Um, and his dad was the same rank as my dad was uh, when he got out and um, had very similar experiences in terms of upbringing. So we, we just clicked and uh, ended up going to the Cleveland Clinic. And this will give you some, you know, some perspective of the Cleveland Clinic. And this is just the main campus operation picture here. It's about 117 acres of uh, clinical space in the east side of Cleveland, uh, pretty massive operation uh, that goes on there and um, was you know, very proud to work there for 12 years. Stayed there probably five years longer than I had wanted to. My goal was to be a CFO, but my kids were uh, in high school and you know, decided to, for the most part, stick it out until, until they were done. So essentially what happened was uh, this girl right here. So I got great experiences in Cleveland and was thinking about what my next move was gonna be. And my daughter for ever since high school, she wanted to be in New York City. And so she um, went to, she couldn't get an NYU. So she was pretty disappointed with that. So she went to Loyola in Chicago to be in another big city and to be away from home. And she ends up um, getting a finance degree, which I was very surprised that she would end up getting a finance degree. Um, and so what happened here was essentially um, she started applying for internships at the big banks. And she got uh, um, several offers to come and interview and talk about nerve wracking. And she takes everything so seriously. And all of a sudden she's got three offers for internships at JP Morgan, exactly the place that she wanted to be. And so I thought to myself, oh boy, you know, and so this is, instead of coming home to Cleveland and being with us in Cleveland, she's you know, likely gonna be going off to New York. It's 80% of the internships get offered jobs and knowing her, she would likely get uh, an offer uh, to, for full-time employment, just knowing how she is. And so literally she finds out about her internship in October and I got a call from a recruiter in November and I knew all the recruiters because they you know, were like, they knew my story, they knew, and they were like, well, I know Mike, this is a little early, uh, but um, you know, we have this uh, job open and you know, it hasn't been open for 40 years. And it's a job, a CFO job at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York City. What are the chances of that? And so, you know, been married to my wife now over 25 years. And I just, you know, I decided the first thing I should probably do is tell her before, you know, I start, you know, sending resumes and stuff. And I just said, hey, you know, we're, we're you know, at this, you know, potential job opportunity. It's in New York City. And and she's like, oh, well, that's where Allison's going to be. And so what I figured is, you know, wherever Allison was, my wife would move to, no matter if it was Alaska or what it was. So um, and even better, New York City, uh, you know, we, we would travel here and visit, you know, for vacations and that kind of thing versus going other places. So it's a place we've been many, many times. And so I went through the process and long story short, I ended up getting the job uh, at MSK. And um, so this is kind of where I'm at today. And it's been a very interesting ride because I arrived June of 2009. So I'm basically, you know, call it six, seven months in the job. And then we're staring at a pandemic and we've been basically working in bunkers, if you will, <laughs> our apartments, you know, for the most part, because we're not necessarily hands-on, but I, I hold the title of chief financial officer. So I achieved my 
career goal a little later than I had hoped, um, but with a great organization, when you work at a place like Cleveland Clinic where you're changing the world and you're helping people that can't be helped other places, that's, that's what's happening here at MSK. It's a, it's a jewel of an organization in terms of its scientific advances and the things that it's doing. And it's a, a real privilege to, to work at this organization. Um, and then, you know, you'll probably see a resemblance um, you know, I'm trying to go back to this and hopefully it'll stick here. Um, yeah, too much animation, but you can see that's my wife and I on the left and then my son and daughter. And uh, you might recognize him. He's on the Zoom call here today. He did shave for me, I can see that. Um, and then uh, the dog on the right, which is the boss of the family, that's Ruby. And so that's, that's us. And I'll click back again. If you look in the back of the picture, this was the Thanksgiving Day Parade. Um, we're not too far from where the parade route is or our apartment is. And you can see that's Baby Yoda in the background. All right, so that, that's my story. And that's how I got to where I got. I think the, the, the key for me was, you know, I couldn't make it in baseball, you know, because I didn't work at it. And, um, you know, I worked at my school. I worked at work. And, and just worked hard and just did whatever I had to do to, to sort of advance myself from a career perspective and, you know, feel pretty good about it because it was not handed to me. And you can see, I didn't have anybody sending me to some school. Um, if anybody's heard of Goldie Beacom College, I'd be surprised. And, um, you know, I've done it through all my own resources and, and working hard. So this is, this is, you know, some leadership uh, lessons learned and I'll try to click through these. And so this is something that, you know, I've sort of discovered um, and how I really discovered it, it became an aha, is when I was working in Cleveland, I had a group, a financial planning group that reported to me, and they also had to work with this kind of more, I'll call it technology analytics group. And they just didn't get along and had a lot of challenge with, you know, the guys from financial, the guys from financial planning they wanted to do things and then they're having tr trouble, you know? And so we decided to, you know, have HR sort of intervene and help us do some team building. And they had this exercise where people got into quadrants and there was a what co quadrant and a how quadrant. And they all got in the how quadrant. And my team got in the what co quadrant. And so, you know, what, what I would try to translate here is that what I've found, and sometimes this would get you in trouble, is that if you have to kind of decide what you want to do before you figure out the how. And a lot of times the people that put the how in front of the what, they never get to the what. And so this kind of gets into goal setting. And so it's just something that, you know, and it may not be the right what, but you're better off trying something and trying to do something than spin your wheels trying to, you know, figure out how. So, you know, as an example, in my, when I was in Cleveland, Dr. Cosgrove, a very famous heart surgeon, he basically proclaimed, we're gonna go and open up an operation in London. And we were like, uh-oh, what does that mean? And you know what, that operation's opening next month. You know, and so he had a bold vision. And what happens is when you kind of set that vision, things, people figure out how to do it. And so as an example for me, you know, in, in the financial world, you go through a process of closing the books each month. And I was, you know, in a meeting with a team in, in Cleveland, and it was taking like 10 days to close the books. And I said, you know, 10 business days. And I said, we got to cut that in half. And they looked at me, the leadership team, and they were like, well, how are we going to do that? And I said, I have no idea how we're going to do that but this is what we're gonna do. I said, the people on our team out there are the ones that are gonna figure it out, but we have to be confident that they can do it and support them. And after about eight months of the year, we eventually got to that, we ended up getting to six days versus five, but that's about as far as we could push it. And so, you know, as you think about going into the workforce, you know, sometimes you just have to put your mind to what you wanna do and how we'll follow behind that. And now you all have no excuses on this one because, you know, I would, I literally, I did a ton of orientations with 
new people coming in the finance department. I do it here at MSK. And we don't have as many people coming in. It's a little smaller than where I came from in Cleveland. But you have to figure things out. You have to be resourceful. And when I would ask the, team, the, the new folks coming in, I would say, what's the one word? That, re, you know, that essentially allows you to figure things out. And nobody could get it. And I would just say it's Google. I mean, you know, it, not just Google, but there's a lot of resources online. And if you can imagine working and doing things without the internet, you know, you would go to the library and have this thing called the Dewey Decimal System. If you guys have ever you know, heard of that. But that was sort of your resource or the people around you. And so, you have really no excuse for figuring things out. You can take the easy way out and try to get somebody to tell you, but being able to figure things out and get to the right outcome is going to be crucial to your success going forward. The other thing is, is that some of you will want to go into management. And if you think about sports or any other trade where you have somebody that's really good at what they do, they don't always make the best managers. So think about NBA basketball. How many of those coaches really played basketball at a high level? Mostly none of them. So a good player doesn't make a good coach. And so the same thing, you know, the best person that does that, whatever that function is at work, may not always make the best manager. Or they have the potential, but they have to learn how to be a manager just like you would learn how to do some portion of accounting or finance. So management's a science, and it's something that I've spent a lot of time uh, learning about and trying to figure out how to really relate to everybody a little differently, understand their personalities and what motivates people and how to, how to work with them to achieve their, you know, I would call it top game, if you will, in terms of their performance. And it's different for everybody. So it, it's a science to try to figure that out. And there's a lot of tools to do that. But that's for any of those folks that want to go into management, you know, it, it may not be for you. And, you know, you need to make sure that if you want to go that route to be successful, you're going to have to learn how to do it. It just doesn't come, you know, a God-given thing. Um, here's the other thing. I, I don't have a disrespect for authority, but I do not like being told what to do. And if my boss has to tell me what to do, I feel like I failed. And so if you want to be successful, you need to anticipate what it is that your boss wants, what it is that your customers want, the people that you support in that organization, and be proactive around doing that. You know, all they can do is tell you to stop, you know, but most of the time, usually people are predictive and you just need to you know, and so if you think about it, that's that's how your boss will recognize that you can be the boss because you don't have to be told what to do. So think about that one. This is a, a given, but I'll tell you a story about this. As I, you know, I got a C in my speech class. I happened to take it kind of early on and I was in Omaha and I took this job at Allegiant, you know, it was my first director job and, you know, Kind of the funny story is that this guy that hired me, his name was Guy, you know, so Guy Pluggy hired me. And then two weeks after I came onto the job, he quit. And so I really didn't have anybody between me and the CFO and the CFO's got, you know, 25 years of experience and I've really never worked in the health system before. And he says, Mike, you're going to need to give the finance presentation to the management team next month. And I'm like, I've only been here for like two weeks. And he's like, well, here are all the slides. And, you know, here's kind of, he ran me through it. And he said, so-and-so can help you with it. And we put these slides together and, you know, give the presentation. I had never given a presentation in front of, you know, like a hundred people before with a microphone on. I mean, I was literally like a deer in a headlight. And so I got the slides together and I had to basically take those slides and continue to kind of simplify them because I didn't really understand like what was on those slides fully. So I kept simplifying them. And the, um, and literally I, I, you know, practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced. And I just thought I was gonna have a meltdown when I got in front of those the people. And so I finally, you know, I think I was dreaming that I was giving the presentation when I was hardly sleeping. 
so then I get to the, the to the uh, meeting area, and of course I'm last on the agenda, so I got to like sit there the whole time, and you know wait, wait, wait. And this was back when they had these things called transparencies, and so I had this picture in my mind as I was putting the transparencies on the overhead projector, I'd be like shaking so bad they would be like you'd hear them, and I finally gets to me, and I think I was just wore out at that point, and so I get up there, and I like. The calm came over me because I think I was just so prepared and relieved that I was going to give this thing. I gave the presentation and um, didn't have any shakes or anything. And I went to sit down and went to walk out and people were coming up to me like, that is the first time we've ever understood anything that you finance people have ever said to me. And I'm like, oh, wow, I don't really understand it, but I'm glad you do. <laughs> and so, you know, because I think they understood like the material I was learning. But what I learned from that was, you know, I was like overprepared and I was, you know, very, very focused and I simplified the message. You know, I could get up there and try to dazzle people with all kinds of stats and words they've never heard of, but people want to understand what you're delivering. And so I learned to um, try to simplify and translate and so I became kind of known as the executive executive interpreter to take the finance stuff and the things where people could take action. And so I, from that point on, I gave the financial presentation there, you know, every single month that I was there, you know, what ha ended up happening, I had somebody get on my calendar and they said, hey, uh, my boss wanted me to come over and talk to you about this presentation. And I thought maybe they needed help with like information. And the guy sits down, he's like 40 years old, and I'm like 27. And he's like, yeah, he wants you to help me you know, present better. And I'm like, I've given one presentation in my entire career <laughs> you know, thus far, but it was that preparation and really understanding the underlying kind of message that we were trying to send rather than the underlying data. So again, that's a story of just, you know, being prepared. And, and I, you know, in my 12 years at Cleveland Clinic, I gave the monthly presentation there all the way through that time period. Uh, I had maybe missed a couple of times when I was out of the office, but it's certainly something that that going from a C student in speech to doing that, and, I, and I'll tell you, it really, you know, I think helped that I, I, I waited tables as I finished up college, and this will be the last, you know, comment I have, and we'll turn it over for questions. But when I was in my master's program, I had this class that, or a choice of classes, and it was it was a the class was called managing your boss, and I just was intrigued. I'm like, well, wait a minute, isn't my boss supposed to manage me? And it, it was all about, you know, kind of like not being like being told what to do and anticipating. And so really understand, you, you know, you can all relate to this by people in your life, but, you know, you can kind of get along better if you can anticipate what people want and understand what people want. And so I took that class um, about managing your boss. And then I remembered back when I was waiting tables and this was back when I was at Goldie Beacom. I was, you know, it was a great way to make money. It was outside of school hours. Uh, and, you know, for anybody that's into tax, you know, you could sort of avoid the tax on your tips if you, if you, were, if you were careful. It was a high-end restaurant, so I was making, you know, pretty good cash tips. And we would have a competition. And this kind of gets into managing your environment. We'd have a competition as waiters. And this, you know, professional waiter, obviously, that was waiting tables there, little black guy, he was the best waiter and he always had the most money. And, you know, it was not easy for me to say, I, I, wanna, I wanna beat him. But I finally broke down and I'm like, Alan, like, how do you do it? And he says, Michael, I manage my tables. I don't let them manage me. And that's, that's the lesson. You know, you, you, if you want to get managed by your boss, great, then don't anticipate, you know, what, what they want you to do. And, and when you're supporting people organizationally and people around you, even though you're in a support function, you can take charge of the situation and make a better outcome for yourself rather than just you know playing defense. So I call this playing offense versus playing defense. So that has been you know probably the key to my success in my career is managing my boss, my environment, you know, not in a bad way, but in a good way, um, in impacting people. So that is the end of my talk and be glad to take some questions. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that story. A really great career that, that you're having and some great stories to go along with it. We now have to open the floor for questions. You can raise your hand. Um, you can put it in the chat. 
and Ileana will um, will be glad to read your question. Um, Larry, before questions begin, I just once again like to remind our students to turn on their cameras. Um, this is an interactive event, so we want to make sure that the speaker can see your beautiful faces. <laughs> I agree, absolutely. I have a question, may I ask? Um, um, hello, Michael. Hey, Stan. That was a ter terrific presentation and, and, a, and great story, a, a great story. And, and uh, as you may know, Larry, Larry and I, I work with Larry, we're both accountants. So um, I, 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 I particularly appreciate, appreciate your story. I wanted to ask you um, in, in terms of your, your role currently, um, we're starting to do quite a bit in the sustainability ESG sort of uh, space, and um, you know MSK. Um, just just by the nature of who MSK is, they're already in the sort of service and giving mode. But is there anything over and above that that you in your role are involved with with ESG or sustainability? You know, I, I will tell you. You know, the main thing that I'm I'm involved with is really supporting it organizationally. You know, from a finance function, you know, obviously we look at our investment pool and we have a criteria of understanding if we're going to make an investment in some in something or if we're going to look to a manager to invest our dollars. It's one of our due diligence areas that we we look at, but you know, mainly just supporting the organization. And as you as you said, Stephen, it's 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 a large focus of the organization and we promote it as much as we possibly can. But it's, it, is, it is something that, um, that it, you know, sometimes can be a little elusive to get people to really think about what it is and how they're contributing to it. But we, we are contributing to it in ways that you, you can just imagine. And, and really the challenges is trying to connect the dots on, you know, we have a charge as a not-for-profit to provide community benefit, which includes ESG. And it, so it's, it's trying to get people to not take it for granted what we're doing, but to try to capture it organizationally so that we can put it all together and demonstrate to the community what we're doing. Yeah, well, thank you for that. It, it's, it's, it, you, you pointed out it's really in, a, in an early stage in large corporations. And, and I think everyone's struggling with similar things uh, in terms of connecting the dots, uh, common, common lingo, common language, what people are, how people describe it. And then the whole reporting thing is emerging too. But yep. thank you for that. Yep. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Matthew? Uh, hi, I'm Matt, Ms. Harrington. Um, thank you again for the excellent presentation. Um, you mentioned moving around quite a bit throughout your chronological timeline, and I was um, wondering if you had faced any challenges with the uh, people in your new communities, whether professional or personal, and how you might have overcome those challenges. Yeah, that, that is a great question, because you, know, you come from Omaha, Nebraska, you're kind of a Midwesterner. And then you move to Fort Wayne, Indiana, and then you find out that's the real Midwesterner <laughs> there, you know, in terms of the, the culture of the people that work. And, you know, so you, you, you know, Fort Wayne was a really small uh, community. Like everybody was born at Parkview Health. Everybody had a family member working at Parkview Health and it was their livelihood. It was the largest employer. Uh, and so, you know, I learned a lot through that job, you know, coming in from, the outside where we had probably a more complicated environment where I came from. We had better business practices. And, you know, what I learned there was, you know, to try to be sympathetic to people. You know, they only know what they know and they may be doing some work, you know, that you're, that, that's, that's happening there, that there's a better way to do it. But they're pretty proud of what they do. And they just don't know that there's other tools that could make their work better. So trying to figure out how to finesse the, the change in terms of getting them to see the light that there's a better way to do things. And so that's more from a work perspective. And in the community, when you're in a small town like that, you're kind of in a bubble. You know, every, you know, everybody, a lot of people know everybody. And so, you know, it's one of these things where you just have to kind of, uh, you know, be a model citizen outside of work because you never know who's going to, you know, so it's like, I would love to, you know, wear my, you know, baggy shorts and my hooded sweatshirt and my flip flops and not, you know, have messy hair and, you know, throw a hat, you know, but you never know when you're going to be seen. So that was a little different, you know, so the benefit of being in uh, Cleveland 
you know, I lived sort of outside the city. I didn't, you know, there wasn't a lot of coworkers and stuff. It, you know, it was a pretty big city, two and a half million people. And then New York's even better. You know, as you guys probably know from being here, you know, you rarely see anybody that you, you work with. And, um, you know, here in New York, you certainly can be yourself. So it, it, it's less of a, you know, you can kind of just mix in, but every place that you go, you sort of, the lesson is you just have to adapt to wherever you're going and kind of what's happening there. And the smaller, you know, so thank the Lord, I did not go to London, Kentucky, because that would have been a fishbowl to, to live in London, Kentucky. But my wife put the mix, mix on that one. Good question. Thank you, Matthew Elric. Yes, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question is, uh, did you have any major crisis that you have yet that you had to resolve uh, during your time as a CFO and uh, how did you manage to resolve it? Well, very timely. Uh, so um, I'll talk about the pandemic, okay? And so, uh, you know, very uncertain time. So it, it was like probably February, and then we all realized that this pandemic was the real deal. And I remember talking to my team, I'm like, you know, this was like late January. We all have to be prepared to work remotely. So when you work in a finance, you know, in an accounting department, you have a lot of vital things that you do, like collect cash, you know, to pay bills and also to make sure bills get paid. And most importantly, to make sure that the caregivers and people that work there actually get their paychecks. So all of a sudden you're gonna go completely remote and you have to make sure there's continuity in every activity that you have. And so that was a challenge at a time when if you think about the early part of the, the, the pandemic, the stock market was crashing. And so we have a fairly large endowment that we rely on to support some of our activities. And all of a sudden, you know, liquidity is a problem because what happened was we were told by the city to basically stop any elective activities, which you can imagine in the cancer center, you wouldn't think there would be, but for a period of time, you can pause things. And they asked us to turn our, uh, uh, call it our, our beds that we have for uh, recovery from the operating room into inpatient beds because they thought all the inpatient beds were going to fill up. So in the month of April, our revenue dropped by 40%, four zero. Massive. That's like our entire margin for the entire year. Like in one month, you know, we don't run a, a big, big margin business. And all I'm thinking is we're going to run out of cash. We're going to literally run out of cash and we're going to have to go into the endowment and start pulling money out of the endowment. And so we, not only do we have to stabilize our operations, we had to basically, you know, do forecasts around liquidity. Like, you know, if this persists, when do we run out of cash? And how do we get liquidity? So we're calling our banks, you know, to get line of credits. Now, the good thing is, is that, you know, I think, you know, since we're kind of a, you know, the oldest cancer center, we're here in New York City, you know, the banks definitely were gonna to try to help us out. So we were able to secure lines of credit. We went out and did a pretty rapid uh, $500 million bond issuance to secure liquidity. And what ended up happening is the government then stepped in and provided basically some, uh, I'll call it advanced Medicare payments to us that we would repay over time. There were some other forms of liquidity from the CARES Act, but it, it was a very tenuous time. You know, Normally you would do these forecasts, you know, periodically throughout the year, we were doing them weekly, trying to understand what was happening with cash and making sure we weren't gonna have to hit the endowment. That was the whole, because once you start liquidating assets that are, you know, that, that becomes a, a challenge, especially if those assets are of illiquid form, you usually have to pay a, get a haircut on. Plus you don't wanna liquidate them when they're hopefully artificially low. So it, that was a real life example. I've never experienced like, you know, I was in the financial crisis in Cleveland, like a, a second year in, in Cleveland. And that was like, you know, one of the closest things, but this was kind of the real deal. We didn't know what was gonna happen. And what, what's interesting is you come out of the, the, the pandemic and because we didn't have to liquidate our assets, guess what happened as the stock market went up, you know, we basically had about a 45% increase in our endowment 
over that period of time. And if I had to take money out to pay bills and didn't secure the financing just in case, um, we would never have realized that. So that's a, you know, real life, you know, my you know, first six months on the job as a CFO, that's, that's what I'm faced with. So <laughs> the, the, the beauty is I have a great team. So it really is all about teamwork. And when there's a crisis and there's a you know, fire, everybody's willing to get a little wet to put it out. And the team really came together. We, we never skipped the beat. We've been working remote for two years. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I have a question from Professor Chung at the Department of Accounting. He says, thank you for sharing your uh, life at the Dean's Roundtable at Leuven. What kind of management skills or merits do you think made what you are or who you are now? Well, you know, I think that, um, the, the, you know, nobody could ever do it better than I did. That was my, that's kind of how when I was an analyst. And, you know, I took great pride in being able to, you know, I was writing SQL statements in the early 90s, you know, because I, I didn't want to have to rely on the people. And this was when I was working at United Healthcare. Um, and so, you know, my view was I can do it better than anybody else. And I thought, okay, this is, this is sort of how I'm going to get ahead. Then I realized that, okay, well, if I can't figure out how to get others to perform at the top of their abilities, then I'm just going to be a specialist and my, you know, kind of ability to move up is, is and so that's when I really thought about management as a science. Now I grew up playing sports. And so, you know, the coach can't get on the field. The coach has got to figure out how to get the team to perform how to get people in the right spots, how to get the most out of each team member through whatever mechanism. And so I would say just translating what I learned from sports into management as a science. And so to give you, you know, just a high level example, um, we have job competencies. And I learned this back when I was in Omaha and I took it to Indiana and I took it to Cleveland and here at MSK and I credit it to the success of the teams is that we, we do personality profiling for every team member. So we know kind of how they tick. And then we have competencies assigned to each type of job that we have. And based on certain personality profiles, you know, if you're a very introverted person, a job that requires being extrovert is probably not gonna work. And so part of this is one, helping people know what they need to work on to get to a certain level in a job and being able to have good communication. So the other thing is, you know, we're, we're accountants, you know, we're not HR people. So we have to have a common language so that when we give people constructive feedback or we tell them why they don't qualify for a job and what they need to do about it, you have to have some common uh, nomenclature. So we use a tool called Lominger, which has um, 67 competencies, you know, across the spectrum and they can be linked up to jobs. So you can basically say, here's what differentiates a director from a manager, you know, political savvy, business acumen, those kind of things. And so for me, it was really, you know, so like if you play baseball and you're gonna be a catcher, there are certain things you have to work on that are unique to that position. So the same in, in the work life. And so being able to do that in a constructive way and have people work on, so we have development plans and career goals for every uh, member of the team and, they're all working on that. And it's kind of like the classic thing where you don't get credit for doing a development plan. It's like shooting free throws in basketball. Uh, you only get credit if you actually make them in the game. <laughs> you know, you can practice all you want and practice will hopefully help you make them in the game. But, you know, to me, that's the single thing that I credit along with managing, you know, my environment, which I would, you know, throw this in there to be able to affect, you know, I figured that if I could get 10 people to do what I was doing, then that's gonna be a lot more effective than me trying to do it all. And so, and again, also accepting that everybody's gonna do it a little different. And so it's not exactly like I would do it, but if they got it done and, and it was satisfactory to the person that they did it for, you know, how would they know it was me or them? But it was one of those things where you just have to kind of let go. And, it, and it's almost like, I wish I would have had children before I had to do this kind of thing, because that's sort of what you learn about your children. You gotta kind of let them, you know, let them go, but it's, it, management's a science and it's a key to 
I think, being successful uh, for me anyways. Uh, Leanne? Um, thank you for the presentation. So I do have a, um, one question. So um, during the presentation you mentioned in your career, there was a very difficult time that you almost think that you, um, um, you lose it. So how did you um, get, like, get your dogs back together and really work through that? So that is my, uh, one of my questions. And the second one is um, probably um, Dr. Chung also um, touch, um, touch up on this point. So doing the financial report, which is a lot of um, accounting days, is very different than what your role is, which now that is an executive VP. Um, what skill do you think that is most useful for the transition? Like what um, for your current role is a lot of planning and a lot of like um, uh, people management. Um, what do you think that it will be like very useful for us to keep in mind? Yeah, so, you know, somewhat of a crisis point, I think you kind of put it on yourself as a crisis point is that, you know, sometimes, you know, you just have to take a chance and you have to use your instinct. You have to reach out to other people to kind of get their perspective on things. And, you know, I, you know, I had, you know, several times where I just was sitting in my office thinking, I don't know how to proceed with that. And, you know, sometimes you just got to step away from it and, you know, maybe go talk to somebody, get their input or just try something, you know, and at the end of the day, if you, you know, that's why I tell people that, you know, that are on the team is that, if you fail, but you failed trying, then I, I'll give you some credit, you know, for, for, for that, you know, and a lot of times, you know, people, they just don't try, you know, because they don't want to fail. And so I think it's a, not, and, and, and what ends up happening is rarely do you fail. Usually you can figure it out. Um, you know, the transition to my role um, here, what I found, you know, so, you know, having come from Cleveland, you know, which was, you know, three times, you know, 20, 20 plus hospitals, you know, 75,000 employees. I mean, it was, couldn't have better training ground. And, you know, coming here, it wasn't so much the, you know, it was learning the cancer business a little bit more in depth, but for me, it was the board interaction. And so if you want to go out and Google who's who in New York, just look at the MSK board. And, you know, I'm talking to a billion, a billionaire, you know, once a week, you know, and um, it can be a little intimidating, but you know what, they're people too. You know, they've had some fortunate circumstances in their career, right place at the right time, they put themselves there, but they're, they're good people. And, 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 you know, I, you know, it's a, so just trying not to be intimidated by that. And also, um, you know, again, it gets back to like managing your boss. So I've got the chair of my finance committee, who's John Strangfeld, who was the, you know, a couple of years ago, he stepped, stepped down and retired as uh, CEO of Prudential, you know, pretty, pretty, you know, but couldn't be a better guy. And it's a matter of just managing my relationship with him and, and just trying to make sure I'm communicating as much as I possibly can. And, you know, he's new to this role. I had Cliff Robbins, who's a famous investor that, um, got into another line of business and he's been doing it for 20 years and so he stepped down so my job is to figure out john and figure out what makes him tick and figure out how best to interact with him so that we have a good relationship so you know each job is different but you know my past job in cleveland i was number two so i mainly you know dealt with the executive leadership team and not necessarily the, the board so that's been the new part here for me and it's been exciting and challenging at the same time, but they're, they're, even though they're billionaires, they're actually really nice people. And I believe this will be the last question, Professor Peng Wang. Hi, sorry, um, I have to look at my other screen, but I just, uh, I don't have a specific question, but I just want to share that my husband graduated from Nebraska, <laughs> got his PhD from UNL, when I travel to see him during, you know, summer break, everyone asked me like, you know, oh, where's that place? I still have the phone number with 402 because that's where, you know, Nebraska is. So yep. um, it's a small world. And, you know, coincidentally, my sister-in-law did her 
um, medical residency at Cleveland Clinic. So oh, wow. yeah, yeah. So um, so she's an ophthalmologist. So I thought that's you know it's a small world. But I want to thank you because I think I've attended a couple of you know the seminar here, and I think your presentation is very down to earth, and I really appreciate that. And I think you're such a humble person. So if there are students here listening, I think one of your leadership skill is being humble. I, I think that's definitely something we can learn from. Um, I appreciate that's it. And I have to go to class now. And thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I th I th we're just about out of time. And let, let me just uh, thank you, Mr. Harrington, for taking time on your busy schedule to be with us today. This is a wonderful Dean's Roundtable. Thank you for the wonderful advice that you've given and sharing your career. We have a small token of appreciation to you. Unfortunately, I can't hand it to you through the camera. So look for it soon um, to be delivered to your home or office, whatever, whatever address we have. And thank you very much for being here. And thank everybody else for attending too. Yep. Thank you, Larry. Appreciate it. Bye, everybody. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone.